Hi, and welcome back. Uh, in this last uh, video on interactive graphics, we're going to talk about R Shiny. And Shiny is uh, a, a way of making interactive web applications uh, that are entirely R based, so they don't require learning any other sort of uh, you know, Java or other web utilities um, in order to kind of make uh, more, more advanced and uh, in interactive visualizations and applications that, that provide some uh, additional complexity, but additional power that kind of goes beyond what you can do with, with things like Plotly. Um, so the thing that's going to be uh, kind of a steep learning curve with Shiny is that it takes a different approach to programming than uh, what we've seen so far in this class, which is kind of sequential programming. You know, I kind of talked about when we first introduced R, you know, you would, you know, you run, you have a script, you would run, run line by line, and when you run something, you know, it doesn't go back and change other things. Um, and you kind of think of this as, you know, kind of a recipe that you're going through top to bottom. Uh, in reactive programming, things are a little bit different. You know, you're setting up, you know, chunks of code that do things, uh, but now you're setting up in an interactive system where the, the doing of those things is now what we call event driven. Um, so we, we, you know, when something triggers that chunk, it runs, and if something triggers it again, it reruns. Uh, and so anytime the inputs change to a chunk of code, it, it reruns itself. Um, so how this works is we divide up uh, our coding into kind of two parts. One is the code that actually defines our user interface. So this will be like, you know, buttons and, and toggles and pull down menus and things like that. These things are generally just as a class referred to as widgets. And these widgets uh, define our user interface and allow us to control the inputs uh, into our code. We actually have to code these up too, uh, but in in, in R Shiny, you know, it's literally going to return a list of inputs using the input, uh, the the name inputs. So it'll become a special name, uh, and then we write code that responds to those inputs from the widgets that return outputs that are then update the interface. Uh, so we'll see some simple examples, um, and the uh, in a Worth noting that in addition to web pages, which is what kind of sh uh, Shiny was originally designed for, uh, you can also embed Shiny within to our Markdown objects. And in fact, uh, it's that embedding into Markdown is what we're going to use uh, primarily this semester because we, we're using our Markdown to turn in labs. We're not trying to set up standalone web pages. And actually, when you get down to it, uh, using uh, Shiny embedded into Markdown is actually simpler than setting up independent shiny web pages and I think if you can figure out uh, how to do it, it within markdown you can then go on to learn how to make set up independent web pages okay so one of the first things that's useful uh, to know about shiny is uh, there's a whole set of web pages under shiny.rstudio.org that provide a lot of uh, examples uh, and a lot of uh, a whole gallery of examples and, and a lot of tutorials. In fact, the, the, one of the readings that was assigned today uh, about our Shiny was a basic tutorial on that, uh, to read through the tutorial on that, that web page. So here's uh, the gallery that pulls up and you can see um, there's a whole bunch of example apps here for a bunch of different things. Um, this one looks neat, like MRI imaging and uh, other applications. And the neat thing about these applications is you can see both how to interact with them, but then you can access the underlying code to see how they did that under the hood. Um, so if I'm interested in you know, the biodiversity of national parks, I can pull that one up and um, I can view the app, I can view the code and try it on the cloud, blah, blah, blah. So here I can see, you know, for example, makes, you know, provide some interactive charts where I can look up different, the diversity of different species groups and it returns plots of uh, different national parks and different uh, species 
counts for different taxonomic groups or uh, this case is turning returning maps of biodiversity or actual counts uh, of different species uh, for different states. So it changes both tables, it changes uh, maps. Uh, this kind of provides kind of a, a yeah, another interactive library to kind of show species. So kind of a whole bunch of neat stuff. Uh, another one within here, there's also towards the end, uh, some basic demos that you uh, you can go to. And uh, you also want to look at here, uh, just this gallery of widgets, so you can get a feel for some of the types of controls that that Shiny is going to give you over your input. So you have things like buttons, you know, I just click it and it just increases the value. So if within this box here, I can see the current value and I can see that if I, every time I click the button, it goes up. I can have a checkbox. If I check it or uncheck it, the value goes from true to false. And so you could have some underlying code that whenever I check that, you know, it sends a message to that chunk of code and you know, reruns things and updates things. Choice check boxes so I can check multiple things. I can set dates if I click on here. You know, whole calendar shows up. Um, date ranges similarly. Uh, file inputs if I click on here, I can actually um, click and load files if I want to get to our frog data. You know. And it'll load the data. And so if you wanted to pass a whole new data file into an app you wrote, you could have that file input. Um, you can input numbers. You can have radio buttons if you only want to allow one choice. Pull down menus. Sliders to control values. Sliders to control ranges. You can enter just general text. Um, so there's a lot of things that you can use to control inputs into your applications. <clears throat> so if we think about um, how you develop uh, a shiny app, I'm just going to give some, some, some advice here, some of which is specific to shiny, some of which I think is more general good advice for any time we're developing an analysis uh, more broadly. So the, th the first thing I would remember would recommend when developing a, a shiny app would be to start with uh, working code for the non interactive portions uh, with some default inputs yet. So if I wanted to make uh, interactive uh, scatter plot, I'd start with the code that makes the scatter plot uh, in a non interactive way. And then I might figure out what do I want to control about that and you know specify those as inputs say it's say maybe it's the x and y limit on the plot and i would spec you know provide variables for those things and set defaults to them because once you wrap your code within a shiny object it's going to be much harder to debug the underlying code that's actually making the plots or pulling up the tables or running calculations um, i would then wrap those outputs in these render functions that are what return things within the app. Uh, so there's a render data table, render image, render plot, render cache plot. So these are the sorts of things that, that Shiny can return. It's mostly data tables, various forms of plots, and various forms of text and tables. Um, I then might uh, create an input widget uh, to do one thing. And you know, I might just make that button first, verify that it works, then connect that button uh, to my uh, responsive part and give control just to one thing at a time. Uh, and then once that's working, incrementally add complexity. And that, that idea of starting with the simplest possible thing you can and incrementally adding complexity, I think is a very good general recommendation for any development, um, as is the key part of, of checking that the app works after each step. Because if you do each of these steps incrementally, if something breaks, it's much easier to debug what broke because it's just going to be—it's going to be related to the most recent thing you added most of the time. Uh, that said, once in a while you add something new and it underlies—you know—it exposes something wrong you did earlier that wasn't apparent. 
Uh, so it's no guarantee that it's just with the most recent thing, but it does definitely help you narrow down uh, what went wrong. By contrast, if I wrote, if I just sat down here and like, I wanna have 17 controls on this thing that runs this complicated calculation, I code it all up and it doesn't work. I have no idea which of those things uh, broke. Um, so you know, go in incrementally. So gonna walk through a simple example. We say we start with some working code. So here's code that uh, makes a histogram of some eruption data from Faithful. In this case, it's old Faithful. Uh, and then it adds a density uh, plot on top of that uh, histogram. And I'm hard coding the two variables I'm gonna to wanna to be able to control my app, the number of breaks in the binning of the histogram and the bandwidth smoothing of the uh, density plot. And so this will make those, I have two variables I wanna control and I'll just make the plot and verify uh, that this in fact makes uh, the sort of plot that I'm interested in. So here's the not, completely non-interactive version of that and I verified that's working first. Uh, they would then wrap this in my shiny render plot function, which has an interesting syntax because I have shiny render plot parentheses, and then I have my squiggly bracket open, squiggly bracket close parentheses. So I'm li li literally calling a function and passing it a whole chunk of code because <clears throat> that's a chunk of code that I want this function to run uh, anytime the inputs change. Now, just wrapping this in the render plot function and not changing the inputs will actually result in a figure that, uh, you know, uh, should knit to look like the exact same thing it did before. So it sh you shouldn't notice anything change changing when you wrap the outputs. That said, if that breaks you, you know, you know where to start. It'll, it'll be more obvious if you have uh, something that has multiple outputs, because it would now be able to render them uh, in the specific order and arrangement that you want the plot layout to be. So that can be helpful for setting out layout layout. Uh, then I might add an input widget. So I now have this plotting function and now I'm going to add this shiny input panel which is going to set up uh, a control panel where all the, the buttons are. Uh, and in fact because I put this input panel before the plot, uh, I'll step back, because everything's coded up reactively it doesn't actually matter uh, for the functionality which I put first, the input panel or the render plot, but it matters for the visualization. If I want the buttons underneath the plot, I put it second. If I want the buttons over the plot, I put it first. Uh, so I have my input panel, um, and I'm gonna, in this case, have a, a select input that is gonna return a variable named breaks. So this first argument is the thing it wants to return. The label is actually the label on the, the input itself. In this case, it's a pull down menu. So I have, uh, I'm giving it four discrete cho choices. Uh, and the selected equals 20 is setting the default. So I have a pull down menu, starts with the default. Um, and if I wanna add more choices, I just need to come back and add more options here. And then the rest of the plot is mostly the same except I've now changed uh, the port where we're hitting the, and putting the number of breaks in my histogram, which used to be, be hard-coded, I'm now passing that as a variable, input dollar sign break. So that, that input object is not one that I'm defining within the render plot, it's something that's being passed in by the input panel. And the, very, the dollar sign breaks matches this quoted breaks up here. So those two have to match each other. So I, I run this and I get this app and so I, the plot looks the same but now I have uh, a bar up top and I can change that and the number of bins changes, change, oh, why is it not rendering? I think mine is out of date. I have to refresh this app. Uh, I'll do that later. I totally built this too long, early ago. Uh, and then we'd add complexity incrementally. Uh, just quick clarity on, you know, I, I would just have to re-knit this in order to get it working again. Uh, so I'm gonna add complexity incrementally. Um, so next I'm gonna add um, 
an input panel. Um, <coughs> uh, I have my select input, which my uh, pull down menu with my breaks. And now I'm going to add, you know, then comma, uh, a new input, a slider input with a variable name BW adjust for the bandwidth. The label on that, I'm going to set the minimum and maximum on that slider bar range. Uh, value is going to be the initial starting value. Step size is essentially, well, step is essentially, you know, uh, the values you can uh, slide it by. And then I'm going to replace uh, the hard coded adjustment, uh, bandwidth adjustment here with now a call to input and with adjust. And now I have, you know, interactive visualization. In fact, I'll just pause and, and re uh, render this. So I just got back from uh, going back to my R Studio window and hitting uh, knit again on this visualization. So I can now get us back to where we were at the end of our app. Cool. So everything should be working again now. Uh, and I can now see that I can change the bin width, uh, actually the number of bins in my app. And I can adjust my bin with my filter, making it smoother and evening everything out. We're making it narrower. <coughs> and I can make it, you know, too narrow. And in this case, both at this binning and this bandwidth, I'm picking up uh, mostly noise rather than um, kind of picking up signal. So there might be a, you know, a happy medium where I can kind of see some of the details of the data, uh, but not go uh, overboard. Uh, that's all, and uh, like the, like I said, the the R Studio uh, Shiny web page has a lot of additional information for and a lot of lessons. If folks are interested in diving deeper into Shiny, we'll use Shiny not only in Lab Three, uh, but in a couple other labs uh, later this semester. Thanks.